Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 2nd, 2023, the first of the new year. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we outline our initial take on the governor's proposed FY24 budget and 10-year plan. Second, we discuss what we see ahead on fiscal issues in the upcoming legislative session. And third, we explain our takeaway from the recent Cook Inlet Federal Waters oil and gas lease sale. And now, let's join Michael. So here we are, uh, the governor's budget, you've broken it down. That's number one on the Wii. Good morning, Brad. Hit us with it. Good morning, Michael. Well, the um, the the I, I I've analyzed the budget in in four pieces, I guess. One is spending levels. The second is deficit levels, which follow on from spending. The third is the revenue side, and the fourth is the production uh, forecast, which relates to revenues. On the spending side, um, the governor. I think did a decent job of controlling spending, proposing to control spending for uh, FY24. He did not, he has not uh, proposed an increase in K through 12, which I think is going to be the big push in the legislature. He sort of set his negotiating position as business as usual, uh, follow the law as it currently is, don't add uh, additional uh, spending to, to K through 12 of above and beyond what the what uh, uh, the law, the current law provides. And I think that's probably a good, a good starting point from, uh, from a negotiation standpoint, because there's going to be a lot of push for, for increase on, uh, on K through 12. Um, so the FY24 budget spending side looks mm, sort of okay. Um, there's, it's, it's higher on the capital budget side than uh, one would think it would be from what they put in the FY23 a uh, 10 year plan and from what was enacted um, taking out the one time stuff what was enacted um, in FY24 but he explains that as as an increase necessary to take advantage of the federal uh, funding and uh, and and fully uh, tap into the federal funding that may be available the state uh, share of the federal funding that may be available Beyond that, though, when you get into the ten-year plan, and and I think the ten to me the ten-year plan is as important as the as the proposed budget. When you get into the ten-year plan, it sort of falls apart. The reason it does is he uses an inflation factor of about one and a half percent, when the current market inflation factor is two two and a half percent. When you look at the futures market for uh, for inflation rates, what's the what the financial markets are telling us they believe future inflation rates are going to be. So uh, half uh, ish uh, of what uh, of what the financial markets are telling us, and as you go out in time, that really shows much lower spending levels than uh, than uh, than than really the current programs tell you you're on the path to do. The reason the reason for the ten year plan is is to tell you what the rocks and shoals and icebergs are ahead is to tell you if you keep going down this road, what you're going to hit and then, and then give you the opportunity currently to make small course corrections to miss, uh, to, to avoid those rocks and shoals uh, ahead. What the governor does instead, what the 10 year plan does instead is, is say, Oh, when we get to the rocks and shoals, somebody will figure it out. 
And instead of making mid-course corrections saying, look, you know, this, this program is blowing up into big spending. We've got to deal with that now in order to avoid it being a, a big problem later. Instead of doing that, the governor just assumes future generations will figure out something and, and, uh, and just sort of downplays uh, uh, the impact of, of spending levels in, in future years. I don't think that gives Alaskans a good outlook uh, about what they're, uh, what they're facing down the road. Um, and I think it, I think the 10 year plan is deficient, uh, because it doesn't, uh, chart a course, uh, looking down the road of the current programs, you know, continuing to, to reflect inflation, the, where the current programs are taking us. The, the effect of that is I think to right. understate. Well, the it wasn't that. that think... supposed... Go ahead. I'm sorry, and I apologize. We've got a bit of a delay here. But, I mean, I just thought, isn't that the 10-year plan's purpose, to extrapolate what the governor is proposing and then extrapolate it out over, here's, if we do what I'm suggesting, here's what happens over the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, which is why it makes sense, right? I mean, that's what it's supposed to be for. Yeah, exactly. And essentially, he's saying, yeah. no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to assume inflation I mean, the, the big the big factor in the 10 year plan, at least with respect to the operating budget, is what you do with inflation that that sort of controls where the 10 year plan is going. And instead of saying, I need to control spending now, I need to control certain programs now so that they don't blow up into big numbers out in the future. Uh, he's just saying, oh, well, we'll just we'll just we'll just artificially uh, suppress inflation rates and it'll look it'll look better in the future. Uh, we have deficits anyway. We have big deficits anyway that we're facing into the future. But he's but he's by by this by the by the approach of of running the inflation rate re really half of what inflation is of what the market's telling us inflation is. He's really just sort of suppressing uh, what that what that outlook looks for. And I and I so the ten year plan you have to sort of reinflate the ten year plan to to give it a good. Uh, indicator of where we're headed, and we're headed into into very difficult times. So, what does the ten year plan show us? I mean, if you do actually reinflate it with a real inflationary number instead of one and a half percent, you go to the two two and a half percent trial range. What does it tell us? And it says by the time we get to twenty thirty two, we're at a, we're at about a billion and a half uh, in deficits. About a third of the budget uh, is in def is 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 in shortfall. And um, and that's yeah, you know that that's something we ought to know. The way it the, the way it is now, what the governor does on the revenue side uh, is he covers up those deficits by assuming uh, a new revenue source uh, that uh, that starts at three hundred million this year, goes to five hundred million next year, is seven hundred and fifty million, I think, by FY twenty six, and then nine hundred million uh, by FY twenty seven, and nine hundred million through. Through the rest of the through the rest of the of the ten year ten year plan, and that's on his that's on his spending number. So it's you're you're showing nine hundred million dollars in deficits by FY thirty two FY thirty three. You're showing nine hundred million dollars in deficits by FY thirty three, with suppressed spending levels with with below uh, inflation and fund, uh, spending levels. So if you if you blow those if you if you insert if you use um, uh, actual inflation levels, market inflation levels. Instead, we're at a billion five in deficit by by 2032. I guess I guess the 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 other issue, in addition to inflation, the other issue, the top line issue that I think comes out of this budget, is this new revenue category that he has. Um, rather than show deficits, what he's what what the what OMB has done, what the administration has done, is inserted a category called new revenue. And it and and new revenue climbs at the at the levels, uh, at the rate I was just uh, I was just describing. Those new revenues are, um, <laughs> they're they're they're, they're uh, <laughs> pie in the sky. I think is what I said about them. I, other words were going through my brain, but but uh, uh, pie in the sky. I, what he's saying is we used to, the state. We used to call that pushwa. We used to call that pushwa. That's <laughs> well. Okay. That's that's a good word for it. Um, what he's saying is the state is going to be able to sell carbon offset credits, uh, credits for uh, using our forests as a as a as a carbon sink, it's selling the you know, not cutting down the forest, but keeping them intact, and selling the that uh, as a as a carbon offset. And and what he's saying is we're going to, what the administration is saying 
is we're going to be able to get $300 million a year out of that this year, $500 million next year, $750 million the year beyond that, and then $900 million by FY27 continuing on out uh, on into the future per year. Uh, now, Department of Revenue looked at this very revenue source back in April when they did the uh, the, the Department of Revenue fiscal model, the latest Department of Revenue fiscal model. Um, and they projected, get this, 500,000 to 20 million a year, 20 million upside, top side a year uh, from this revenue source. Now, just eight months later, the governor is projecting that at 300 million this year, 500, 750 million, 900 million. Um, there's, and, and, and the administration provides no basis for that projection. So what he's really doing, what he's really doing is hiding deficits by, by creating this category of new revenue and saying, well, instead of deficits, we're going to have this new revenue and it's going to cover uh, 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 the deficits instead. And we really don't need to worry because we're going to have this, this new revenue source. It, the, the 10-year plan really is a, is a fantasy of, of spending is going to be a lot less than we think it's going to be because inflation, we're going to suppress inflation and revenues are going to be a lot higher than we think they're going to be because we're going to have these fantasy sales of carbon offsets that are going to total, you know, a billion dollars, basically a billion dollars by uh, in, in, in four years, and then a billion dollars a year uh, uh, from, then, from then on out. So it's um, the, the, the 10-year plan really gives you a very, if you, if you take it at face value, it gives you a very distorted look of, of, what, uh, of what Alaska is facing. Basically, what he's trying to argue is Alaska is in okay shape. Don't worry about it. We don't need, we don't need real new revenues. Uh, we, don't need to, we don't need to cut spending. Uh, it'll all take care of itself because somehow we'll suppress inflation and somehow we'll, we'll create these additional revenues. And it's just, it's taken at face value. It's a misleading, it's a misleading document. We've got, I'm a pretty pretty simple guy, right? This is like walking into the bank with my financials and asking for a loan and saying, yeah, here's all my budgets. And you could see that I am spending more than I take in, but next year. I'm going to get this inheritance. I know I am. I know that it's coming and I know that, you know, I'm going to create a new widget that's also going to create a new income stream for me. No, I haven't. Dealt. No, I have no idea what it looks like. No, I don't know when my in-laws are going to die or whatever, but I know that that's coming. So I put this in my budget and everything else. Here you go. And you're well, just expecting the bank to go, sure, here's a loan. I mean, that this is, and again, it's the voodoo economics. It is my voodoo economics, Michael. And the, and the one thing I would add to that analogy, which is a very good one, the one thing I would add is, and your rent's going to go down. <laughs> your 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 the the your real rent level is going to go down because the because the landlord right. isn't going to isn't going to inflate isn't going to run your rent up to to equal inflation over the over the over the course of time. So he's doing it both on the on the revenue side in terms of the inheritance and the widgets and that sort of stuff. And he's doing it on the spending side in terms of just assuming that that uh, that we'll find solutions somewhere out there. <laughs> the, the, the irony is is basically what he's saying is I can't find solutions to to spending levels. I'm proposing just you know sort of sort of current spending levels, the continuation of of the programs as they currently are. I can't find them, but somewhere out there in the future, somebody's going to find solutions to the spending levels, and we're not going to have. You know the the impact of inflation that that uh, that that we nor- that we normally have. So it's it, it's it's I can't do it. it's basically I can't do it. I can't come up with the spending cuts. I can't come up with the with the revenues. But somewhere out there in the future, we we will we will you know we'll we'll find all of the solutions to all of that. Brad, is there uh, one? Uh, give me, can you give me one bright spot on the governor's budget and ten-year plan, and then we'll go into the tease for number two? But can you give me a? Is there anything good here, or is it all a fictional bestseller? Well, the ten-year plan is all a fictional bestseller. I mean, taken at face value, it's all a fictional bestseller. There's enough in there that you can that you can you know actually predict where spending's going. You can infl- you can insert the actual inflation rates that the market's telling us we're going to hit. You can look at what, you know, actual revenue sources tell us right now. Um, but it's, um, the 10-year plan is really just, I mean, 
there isn't anything good in the 10 year plan. Uh, the FY 24 budget, you can say it's good because at least he doesn't start new programs or doesn't expand existing programs in his proposed budget. So he set himself up at, with a, with a decent negotiating position with the legislature for FY 24. But if you look beyond FY 24 and you look at what the 10 year plan tells you, he should be, you know, redoing programs right now to, to make our, to make our situation better in the out years. Uh, and he's not doing that. So he's not making it any worse, but he's not making it better in a way that we need to be making the, the, the right. budget better to, to face the to face the 10 years. I'm just continually astonished, Brad, that uh, the governor would I mean, that this would be the way that the governor would. Uh, um you know, you know, the, with a fictional, oh, it's going to be carbon credits. Okay, so what's the history of carbon credits? How much demand is there? What companies or countries or whatever are willing to go? Give me a breakdown. Give me a business plan on your carbon credit model, especially since it said it was going to raise about $20 million and now you're saying $500 million. Give me an – where – tell me how this works. And you have to just, you know, crickets when it's all uh, – when it's all said and done and – uh, he's wait. He's he said he's going to do yeah. that uh, once. The, once the crickets. I like that. <laughs> he said he's going to do that once yeah. the uh, once the, once the session starts. He's going to come up with a plan. He's going to come up with a. But look, I mean, you can. All you have to do is look at what this administration has said about this revenue source. As late as April uh, of 2022, they said five hundred thousand dollars to twenty million dollars. How you get from $20 million upside to $900 million solid, you can count on this, is just, I mean, nothing. There, there's nothing the administration has has provided that, that gives that sort of indication. And, you know, the, the people who have delved into it can't find any basis for it. So it's just, I mean, it, it, it's a plug. I mean, in, in, in any 10-year plan, I guess, sometimes you find a plug. This is a huge plug. It's, it's you know, it's the numbers were otherwise showing big red numbers out there, big deficit numbers out there. So how do we turn those deficit numbers black? Um, and, and you just plug in a, a new revenues. Well, okay. How are we going to, how are we get, what are we going to say for new revenues? Uh, well, we don't want to say taxes, you know, that's a, that's a forbidden word. So we'll just, we'll just come up with something else uh, out of thin air. And they've, right. and they've come up with carbon credits. I mean, Michael, w when you sell carbon credits, you can't resell a forest 15 times, right? You sell carbon credits for a forest and you say, you know, we're going to use that as a carbon sink. And, and that's, you know, that's where we're, that's, that's, you know, we'll do it for the next 10, 15, whatever the, whatever the term of the car carbon credit is. It's not for a year, it's for, for a number of years in order to make it an effective carbon credit to the guy that, the, the person that's, that's buying it. And, and he's saying, right it's it's not only are we going to have 900 million dollars in carbon credits we're going to have 900 million dollars a year uh, uh within, right. within four years and that's just those are one I, I, that's sales. just right yeah those are one-time sales you can't keep reselling the forest to different buyers because somebody's got i mean you know no 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 that is sorry that's my forest you can't use it for your carbon <laughs> offset it's it reminds it reminds me of the old of the old oil trick in Oklahoma where you'd resell a well. You know, you'd sell. You have a hundred percent of a well in the old in the old uh, drilling fund days. You'd have a hundred percent of a well, obviously, and you'd sell it like fifteen times. <laughs> you know, that was that we're was there were, there were pyramid schemes that went, people went to jail for that. Right. Yeah, we're all making money now, right? I mean, we're all making money. That's what it's all about. Uh, all right, uh, Brad, uh, where am I at here? I got everything moved around on my screens. Okay, uh, so we're still got a little bit of time. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I was heartened to see that, that uh, again, he hadn't increased any programs. He included a large PFD. He did all those things, at least to start the conversation. But when I saw that carbon credits and the carbon offsets things, I was like, mm. I don't see anything on how that works. I don't see any explanation on that. To me, that was a huge red flag. But of course, you know, a lot of people just lap it up and are like, okay, it sounds great. We're all, we're saved. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's the same thing on the spending side, Michael. I mean, it's, if you use half inflation, half the inflation rate for the operating budget, everything looks, well, it doesn't look fine because you still have to plug in the, the carbon credits to make it look fine. 
but if you use half the inflation rate, it doesn't, it doesn't, spending doesn't look as bad as, as where we're going. I mean, that's, as I said, that's the entire purpose of the 10 year plan to tell you where you're going, to tell you what the rocks and shoals and icebergs out there so you can develop plans to avoid them. And, and this 10 year plan is just not doing that. Three years ago in FY20, would have been FY21, I think. They did a great 10-year plan. They had a they had different scenarios and they had a, a, a lengthy discussion about the situation we were facing and and how we have to deal with that. And there was a one scenario, scenario five, which I always go back to, which said we need a we need to do some cuts, we need to do some PFD restructuring to go to POMV 5050. And we need to do some uh, 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 revenues, some some personal revenues, and and that was a that felt like a real ten year plan. This one just feels like oh god, you know we got to put out something. So let's let's put out a fantasy. Let's put out you know that that we somebody controls not us, but somebody controls spending somewhere along the way, and um, and somebody uh, comes up with new revenues along the way, and 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 so everything looks better, you know, by the time we get to the end of it. Uh. It's so painful. So painful. I mean, why can't I just stay on vacation? That's what, that's what I'm asking right now. It was so much better when it was all on vacation. All right. Quick tease for number two, the session, the upcoming session. I mean, I see Kathy Geisel's done a podcast with the ADN. I'm interested to see what, uh, what, she, what kind of nugget she drops in there, but give us a quick tease. Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be the, the, the normal stuff that we've gotten used to. It's going to be the legislature's going one direction, sort of regardless of how the house forms. The legislature's going one direction. The governor's going, trying to go another direction. And the PFD is the thing that's going to get squeezed in the middle. Um, and I'll describe why that is uh, when uh, when we get to the next uh, next segment. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. And we are uh, we're ready to uh, to knock it in with him for number two of the weekly top three, which is the new upcoming session. Oh, what does he expect to see? Uh, I mean, I guess, Brad, first of all, I mean, I don't know. Is the House going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a bipartisan, by by camera? What is it going to be? Or is it is it by or is it straight? I don't know. What is the House going to be? And what does the Senate's uh, democratically controlled coalition mean? You guide me. Give me an outlook here at number uh, two. Oh, I don't. Uh, I, I, my 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 prognostication skills are not good enough to, to predict whether the house is going to form as a coalition uh, or as a Republican led, but at the margin, I don't think, I don't think that's going to make much of a difference to the ulti- to the fundamental dynamics of what's going on in the legislature. Even if it's Republican organized, I think there's going to be a pressure uh, to uh, increase K through 12 spending. Certainly there's going to be that pressure in the, um, uh, in the Senate, if you when, once you listen to Geisel's uh, uh, podcast, you'll you'll understand that that there's a lot of uh, pressure in the Senate for uh, for increased K through 12 spending uh, that will that will roll over into increased university spending that will roll over into a defined benefit plan for uh, for teachers that will roll over into a defined pen- benefit plan for other state employees. Uh, all of which they're going to claim is somehow decreasing uh, spending, state spending by by allowing uh, uh, not having the turnover in employees and 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 reducing the amount of of, of, of salaries that we need to to give them because we're going to have a defined uh, all sorts of mumbo jumbo that essentially is going to give you a a lower cost uh, uh, from defined allegedly a lower cost from defined benefit plans. We're going to see a lot of push for increased spending in the house. Even if it's Republican organized, it's not going to be able to push back on all of that. At the margin, it may push back on a little bit more than what a, a, a coalition-led House would look like. Coalition-led House probably would combine with the Senate with with larger spending packages than what we're going to see coming out of the coming out of a Republican House. But we're going to see increased spending pushes for increased spending, uh, particularly in K through 12, uh, uh, sort of regardless of, of which body forms. Or, or which way the the house forms, um, and we'll see the governor pushing back uh, on that to some degree. Although he's already said when he when he when he announced the budget, he said it doesn't have any increase in K through twelve spending. But I anticipate that will be an issue, and I anticipate we'll end up with some. 
So he was sort of staking out his negotiating position as opposed to saying, no, we're not going to have any increased K through 12 spending. It was sort of like, this is my starting point. You give me yours and we'll sort of, we'll sort of figure out where we're going to go from here. So, so we're going to have, we're going to be facing increased spending. We're already starting out with a $300 million plus deficit, uh, uh, even in this budget, right. because the, the 10 year plan covers that with $300 million in, in credits the first year. Um, what's be, because the administration has not come forward with a realistic revenue plan. Uh, what you're going to have then is increased spending against uh, against insufficient revenues to cover not only increased spending, but current spending, uh, a built-in deficit that you're starting with. Um, and you're going to find the, the, the same thing we've had the last few years before, before the run-up in oil prices. But you're going to find the same thing we had, which is increased spending, motivation for increased spending against short revenues. And what's going to get crushed in the middle? The PFD. And that's going to continue to be the case until the administration comes up with a realistic revenue plan. The legislature, I don't think, is going to move forward on a, leg- on a, on a revenue plan until a realistic revenue plan until the administration comes up with a realistic revenue plan. And, and because they're not going to put themselves, they're not going to repeat the, the situation of last year, which is they pass, pass the tax only for it to be fodder for the governor to make headlines by vetoing the tax. They're not going to go through that effort and take the slings and arrows of passing a tax only to have it, only to have it vetoed in the end, only to, for it to be used for a press release by the governor. So we're going to continue to have the 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 push the pressure for increased spending this year is going to be K through 12 it's going to be defined benefits it's going to be increased university spending and 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 a lack of revenues to support that and so the PFD is going to be the thing that that gets uh, crushed in the middle and and that's just I mean you can see it coming uh, you can see it in Gary Stevens statements uh, immediately after the budget was released saying he thinks the PFD is too high you can see it in other comments that have that have uh, Giesel uh, and others making comments that the that the PFD is too high. Well, the PFD is the, the current law of PFD, and and they're not right. talking about actually changing the current law. They're just talking about ignoring the law again and using the PFD as the grease uh, to that gets uh, that that sort of ultimately lubricates the the budget getting getting put together by 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 being the 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 way that uh, the the revenue source PFD cuts being the revenue source that uh, that balances the budget. And, and, and once again, you know, I'm picking up the theme that we had last year. All you're doing when you do that is saying that middle and lower income Alaska families are going to be the ones that budget that, that ultimately have to fund the budget because the top 20% is, is using techniques that enable them to, uh, to dodge paying. The oil companies are using techniques that enable them uh, to dodge paying. So that it's, you can, you can, you can, you know, get into the nitty gritty of, of, of pieces of legislation and say it ought to be this as, as it's opposed as opposed to that and I'm sure we'll do that uh, in the coming weeks in the coming months but big picture going in uh, is increased spending against insufficient revenues 300 million to start 300 million deficit deficit to start that will grow as uh, as as the increased spending uh, gets layered on and the PFD will be the thing that uh, that 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 ultimately gets used as uh, as the as the grease to to make the budget fit. Does the governor get any credit for um, starting at least with a high PFD, or does that just give them more of a buffer to spend? I mean, what what do you say here? I actually don't give the governor any credit for starting with a high PFD because he doesn't have a realistic revenue side. I mean, he's 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 essentially saying, "Look at me! I get headlines by proposing a high PFD." But I've not put together a budget that supports that PFD. I, 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 I get I, I get headlines for support for proposing a current law PFD, but I've not given you a budget that has the revenues that supports a current law PFD. So it's 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 misleading, really, to claim that he's got a he's got a full PFD uh, in this budget because he doesn't have the revenue base. Uh, on the on the revenue side that can support uh, the spending levels that we're that that we're headed toward. He hasn't. Nobody's going to make cuts more than what the governor proposes. The governor hasn't made the cuts necessary to get us down to a balanced budget. He hasn't proposed realistic revenues 
necessary to get us to a balanced budget. So you can say that you're proposing a, a statutory PFD, but there's 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 no way you get to it on the budget he's right. actually actually proposed. Because the governor's budget is always just a starting. It never it never goes lower than the governor's budget. It always goes higher. So he could have started with cuts, and uh, and then it would have increased from there. But really, he put the pie in the sky. Oh, look at this magical. Uh, MacGuffin, you know, that's the thing in the movies that makes the whole plot work. The MacGuffin at this point is the carbon offset credits with got no plan, no business, that no, you know, no nothing. And uh, but no cuts either to make it work. And, you know, like you said, just grabbing the headlines with a high PFD. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, this budget isn't realistic and the 10 year plan isn't realistic. I mean, you've got to. Right. Yeah, I've, I've tried to adjust for all that in the, in the last two Alaska landmine columns I wrote over the, over the holidays. And you put those together and you sort of get a picture of what a realistic budget is, but this budget's just not realistic. It's a, it's a, it's a head. I think you said it correctly. It's a headline grabbing. Look, look at all the good things I did, but not a realistic plan to get you to those headlines, not a realistic plan to get you to a full statutory PFD. Brad, we got about two minutes here. Can you give me a quick synopsis of number three? Yep. Um, so we went through a lot of poli- Alaska went through a lot of political capital to get uh, the Department of Interior to issue Cook Inlet leases uh, uh, for the federal government to have a Cook Inlet lease sale. And and everybody complained about Biden, you know, not having the lease sale. Joe Manchin finally put a provision in the in the last uh, in the last le- in the last Congress that required the administration to have a lease sale. They had a lease sale. They had about 190 leases uh, up for sale in federal waters. Uh, there was one bid by one company on one lease. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it we spent a huge amount. Alaska spent a huge amount of political capital getting this lease sale, saying, you know, you need to Biden. You're you're causing you are causing the problem. We need to have these lease sales. We need to we need to get the opportunity out there for for people to invest to develop additional oil and gas. Uh, the administration has the lease sale and they get one bid on one lease out of 190. So it's, I mean, the credit is, it's the boy who cried wolf, right? I mean, right. The credibility of Alaska on these lease sales is just getting lower and lower and lower. Anwar, we had the lease sale up in Anwar. We had a limited number of bids. Everybody's dropped out except the state who wants to, for some reason to continue spending money on, on, on the leases that it, uh, that it bought up there. We have we we spend all this political capital to get the Cook Inlet lease sale, and we get one bid out of 190. So it's we we we're using up our political capital for things that aren't realistic. Yeah, I saw that one lease sale for what sixty eight thousand dollars or something. I mean, it was uh, uh, I mean, it was crazy. All these lease sales, Hillcorp votes on the bids on the one thing, and then everybody's like, "That was it. That was the whole. That was the whole thing." I mean, I I don't know what to say. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, we've got we've got a huge federal decision coming up. The 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 federal government, the Biden administration's decision on Willow, uh, whether or not to permit the Willow operation to go forward, or under what terms and conditions Willow can go forward, is a huge decision. Over the over the break, I think it was over the break. Uh, the president of Conoco, Alaska, gave an interview to Bloomberg. And essentially said, look, if, if the Biden administration doesn't give us three locations, uh, three uh, footprints uh, in, in NPR, in NPRA to develop the Willow project, if they limit us to two, we're not going forward. We can't make it economic on two. Uh, the, 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 the huge push of the environmental community is to get is to get the Biden administration, if they're not going to kill Willow, uh, uh, to only approve two, uh, two footpaths. Um, uh, fr- footprints uh, on the slope, and um, and that that is a huge decision because Willow, we got a, we got a willing investor ready to go forward. Uh, we've got uh, known well as as much as you can know about oil and gas. We've got a known resource uh, ready to be developed. Um, we've got uh, Conoco, a, a, a big corporation, willing to back it up, willing to make the investment, willing to enter into the contracts to get it developed ready to go forward now, ready to go forward this winter. Um, and now the Biden administration is saying, 
uh, we push that we're going to push the, the decision off until March, maybe uh, not really get a final decision until May. Um, and so Conoco is sitting there, you know, we're sitting Alaska is sitting there just sort of really, you know, this is realistic. We need to go forward with this. And then we and then we're burning political capital all over the place in the meantime on Cook Inlet. You know, we spend all this political capital to, you know, ban banging on the Biden administration for not going forward on Cook Inlet. Um, and, and so, you know, we finally put into the legislation that you've got to go forward with Cook Inlet. Then we have that sale and we get one out of 190 uh, leases uh, a, a bid on. And, and then not even much of a bid, $60,000 for a lease block. We have Anwar where we, you know, bang on the Biden administration to go forward, they go forward. Uh, and then how everybody's dropping out, uh, except for the state of Alaska. And, and frankly, the administration is doing that for political purposes, just to keep that issue alive, to keep to, to retain the ability to bang on the Biden administration more and more and more. Instead of, to me, instead of concentrating our political capital all on the thing that we know that's realistic uh, that we can deliver on that will give us oil and gas, that will give us investment, that will give us um, increased throughput on taps, that will extend the life uh, of the North Slope by bringing on new oil, new fields, and new new developments. Um, instead of concentrating all of our political capital on that, we're we're we're, we're spreading it out on all of these other things that aren't realistic. I mean, no one, no one that I know of had ever said the federal waters and the Cook Inlet are critical to oil and gas development. It was always like, yeah, maybe someday we'll get there. Uh, but no one has ever said, I really, right. I really want to put a lot of money into federal waters and the Cook Inlet. <clears throat> but we put all that political capital into federal waters and the Cook Inlet. And now we just sort of look like, I don't know. We, we don't look, we, we, we don't come out of this looking very good, having spent all that political capital for that, for that lease sale. So hopefully, we, hopefully we get a good decision out of Willow, but, you know, we've we've sort of undermined our credibility a little bit with this whole uh, with the whole Cook Inlet uh, uh, lease sale situation. Well, we'll have to see what it has. I mean, obviously, we could have waited for a better time, but it was an election cycle, and somebody needed to pad their resume and say, <laughs> "Look what we did for you." So, uh, you know, I guess not a not a surprise at this point. Brad, what are you looking forward to this next week? Here, we got about a minute and a half. Oh, we ought to get more statements uh, from legislators about what they see going forward. We ought to get more reactions to the to the PFD as people uh, start uh, start getting ready. We ought to have more analysis of what's in the budget. Uh, we ought to have you know more people looking at uh, various components of it. Um, and and I think I think we we're we're launching into the budget cycle now, and we'll start seeing uh, bits and pieces. I don't think we'll see the administration's proposal for what these carbon credits are going to look like. Actually, I really sort of wonder if we'll ever see that. I mean, the Dunleavy administration right. has in the past announced programs like, remember gambling? We were going to have a gambling bill. Yeah. Well, I, remember, yep. I remember we're going to have that uh, state lottery. We'll do it. And what? And, it and went then, away. And then it just never showed up. We paid a consultant some huge amount to get a, to get a bill and then it never showed up. So I'm, I'm really actually yeah. wondering if we'll ever see these carbon, the carbon credit bill. Well, it's, um, <clears throat> I guess it's reassuring in some way to know that some things never change, Brad. I come back from vacation and we're still facing the same problems that we always have. At least uh, we know that that'll never change, but uh, I don't know. I, you know, look, <clears throat> we got to have a glad heart. We got to, we got to keep fighting a good fight. We got to keep, you know, pointing out uh, when people are being hypocritical or when things are again, just for show, which I think a lot of this is kabuki politics really more than anything else and uh you know i'm i i think we just need to keep calling it out uh we can't go weary and well doing so um but we'll i guess we'll we'll do what we got to do i agree michael we, we we need to know the reality we're dealing with and we and we need yep. to understand what we're facing i mean let's be honest we're facing pfd cuts yeah, whatever yep. the governor said in his press release, we're facing additional PFD cuts because we're not getting spending under control and we're not coming up with with realistic substitute revenues. And that's bad. We're pushing the burden of yep. middle and lower income Alaska families. And that's bad. OK, uh, the uh, chimes being uh, time to get ready to go. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming on board. We love having you. We'll see you uh, next week. OK, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, have a good week. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes 
on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.